Well, good morning, you guys. How are you today? Let's try it again. How are you today? All right. So good to All see right. you and, and uh, welcome to the church at Fort Collins. We are going to do a Christmas Eve service right here at 530 on Christmas Eve. Uh, be a candlelight. Um, we're working on a speaker. We're not sure who will do that right now, but um, we are going to have that service. So we're hoping you will bring your families and come and join us um, for that. Um, we're looking uh, at possibly having a church Christmas party, but we're struggling with dates right now. So hang in there with us. Uh, we're not absolutely sure that's going to happen. We'd like it to, but uh, We'll see how uh, the whole thing goes and, and uh, how God uh, sets it up for us, huh? Um, coming up on December the 1st, it's a Wednesday, the Supreme Court uh, is going to be laying down a decision um, about abortion. Uh, you know, the Texas law right now says that after, I think it's, is it 15 or 18? 15 weeks uh, an abortion cannot take place. Um, we, of course, are praying for zero weeks. Um, and the Supreme Court is going to be taking this in hand on that day. And I'm asking you uh, as a church uh, and uh, to tell your families to be praying uh, before this happens. And, and the morning of, uh, we need to, to just bathe this thing in prayer uh, what an awesome thing it would be for the Supreme Court to make a step like this for us and uh, for children, for babies. Um, we need that. And uh, it would be a really, um, uh, dare I say, earth shattering uh, if they were to come forward. Uh, it all has to do with um, the way, um, what am I trying to say? Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization is bringing this uh, to our attention. So I want us to pray over that this morning as we pray. And uh, um, would you take, please, um, yes, open our eyes, Lord. You'll see it up on the screen. Sing with me. the screen read with me together Philippians 4 4 through 8 rejoice in the Lord always again I will say rejoice let your gentle spirit be known to all men the Lord is near be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Pray with me, will you? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and we have invited you into this place. And you are here. Thank you for that. Watch over us this morning, Lord. Uh, we prayed for Stephen, and we're lifting up Elaine, we're lifting up Geraldine. Uh, we're lifting up all of those who are not with us this morning right here in this service, Father God. 
I'm lifting up those people that are watching on the internet right now that you will be with them all week, Father God. You will help them through difficult times, all of us. And that when we struggle, Lord, we remember that you are in control. So many things going on in our community and state and country and world. And Lord, we're trusting in you for all of it. Uh, Things that are totally out of our control, but totally in your control. And we look to you for what you're going to do. Lord, we pray over this decision coming down from the Supreme Court in the the first part of December. Lord, lead these men and women. Touch their hearts that they would make the decision that you would have them make, Lord. Not that this country would have them make. Uh, But help them to be strong. Help them to be courageous. This is a big issue. So many thousands of people involved in all of this. But Lord, so many babies involved in this. Lord, we pray over these little babies that are growing right now. We pray over children that are yet to be born, that you will protect them, that you will just hold them in your precious arms and put those legions of angels around them, that moms and dads would make the right choice when these things happen. We pray over our church that everyone here would be totally listening to you this morning. Father, we pray over Rick as he brings us the message that you would speak through him in a mighty way. Lord, we are thankful for your son, Jesus Christ. We are thankful for the Holy Spirit. And we are thankful for you as our Heavenly Father. Lord, each one of these three require our time, our prayer, our thoughts. Our thoughts. Lord, help our thoughts to be pure. Help them to be clear and clean and of you. When we're tempted to say things, when we're tempted to do things, when we're tempted, Lord, give us courage. Give us strength. We pray over um, the Crosslands. We pray over Elaine and Dick. And we pray over Geraldine. We pray over people who we know, family members that we know that are struggling with different things. We pray over this terrible disease, COVID, Father God, that you would rip it from our country. That you would throw it far, far into the depths of the ocean. And Lord, give those people that are going through these things strength to endure. Uh, The people that are in charge of making decisions, strength to stand up for what is right. We pray these things, Father, as you pray with us and we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Look across the room and wave at somebody and wave at somebody back there on the camera. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to 2 Timothy. And we are looking at 2 Timothy 3, two verses, 16 and 17. Hmm. All right, verse 16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And by the way, it says for correction, but that's our correction, not the Bible's, right? Okay, then if you would turn to Matthew, please. And we're looking at chapter 8, 
verses 23 through 27. Matthew 8, 23. When he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being covered with the waves. But Jesus himself was asleep. And they came to him and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. He said to them, Why are you afraid, you men of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. The men were amazed and said, What kind of a man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Wow. And then turn to Mark. And we're looking at Mark 14. I am purposely not putting the scripture on the screen because I want you to use your Bibles. Okay? All right. Chapter 14 in Mark, verse 27 through 31. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away. Because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, Even though all may fall away, yet I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly, I say to you, that this very night, before a rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. But Peter kept saying insistently, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all were saying, the same thing also. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his... Good morning, kids of all ages. Welcome. It's good to see you all. I always, uh, I always like to, to gaze upon you and see how you're doing. You know, it's something that uh, we're hitting today, and I want you to uh, turn, be turning to uh, Genesis, the 32nd chapter. And to be able to, to look at this, you know, Michael read just a moment ago three, three different scriptures. He read about all scripture is God-breathed. Uh, your life uh, that you have in you is because God breathed into the nostrils of Adam and he became a living soul. That breath is like nothing else. And today I want you to be able to, uh, once again, I want you to be able to taste this uh, God-breathed word from Genesis, the 32nd uh, chapter, because there is so much in this chapter. It's a famous chapter. It's many, many sermons, many uh, writings and uh, so forth have been done, but I want this this morning, it's, it's designed to be uh, profitable for you. Because uh, teaching is a good thing. It's something that brings us an awareness, brings us revelation about what God's doing, what he's saying. But teaching in anything that's in the Bible about God moves us from the concept to where it becomes a part of our nature to where it's exercised in the world we live in. You know, it's amazing how many Christians have never witnessed the demon being cast out. We read about it, but we've never witnessed that. A a miraculous healing right in front of us. In fact, most of us have never experienced someone getting saved in a church service. And so we, 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 we see this word teaching as not something that's just getting us better on the practice field. How would you like to play a sport where all you did was just practice? Man, I'll tell you, I, I, was, I never enjoyed practice that much. But there was something about being in a game where it was like 
on the line, and it, it, there was something about that. I was at a game uh, as a junior high kid, and we had time for one shot. Rick takes a shot. The kid passed the ball into me. He was so excited. I was like so close to him, and he passed the ball like he was throwing it across the world. And it hit me right on the end of my fingers and jammed my fingers. And I grabbed my fingers instead of the ball. The ball kind of flippity-flopped over to one of our guys. He, uh, Robert Scrivener. And Robert kind of tossed it up from what about the uh, the three-point world is now. And, man, he hit nothing but net. Won the game. You know, there's something about being in the game that makes this, this life in Christ and our teaching compatible. But to stay in the place where we just begin to be philosophically more excellent. There's something that, 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 that gets at the heart of God. We were talking about, Michael talking about God the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. I think there's times when me kind of squints like, oh man, you, you could have had the V8. There's something about catching what he's teaching. It's good for reproof. Uh, for all of us who have been the driver and there's somebody in the seat next to us in the back seat who, who likes to comment on our driving skills or the road ahead, all right? And sometimes, you know, we need them. Sometimes we didn't see the car. Sometimes there was a blind spot. Sometimes there was a kid on a bike. But it's also good for correction. Something that's missed, a moonshot that's missed by an inch here, how far off is it when it gets to the moon? It's so far off that it, it's not even, it wouldn't even be remotely able to be corrected to be brought back because the correction at the beginning wasn't done. And for training in righteousness. There's a muscle. When we have Christ in us, we have the, the fullness of Christ in us. But there are characteristics about Christ that we're never exposed to. We're never exposed to the apostle of Jesus. We get a lot of the pastor of Jesus but the teacher of Jesus, the evangelist of Jesus, the prophet of Jesus, we just, we just don't sometimes get flavored by the whole character of Christ. And so our expectations drop. And that he would be what? So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Did you ever have trouble finding your car keys? You never lose your keys like, oh, I get home and... You know, I, I, I need to look for my car keys. No, you look for your car keys when you're late, and you've got to find them, all right? And when they're found, they were right in front of you the whole time, all right? Or they're in the bathroom where you left them, and you didn't think you were even in there, all right? There's something about being equipped and adequate for something that's going to happen that, that God calls a good work. And what we're seeing in this chapter is we're seeing this, this revelation of the Word of God as being breathed of God. Second thing is, we're also seeing the second scripture Michael read of, of Matthew 8. We're looking at the guys in the boat with Jesus. He's already told them they're going to the other side. And they're scared because they're facing something that certain death that fishermen know all about. They, fishermen know water is wet. They know that the waves and the sea and, the, and, and everything just spells tragedy. And they're coming to him, and they're, they're, they're saying to him, save us, we're perishing. Like he doesn't know what's going on. There's something about when he calms the wind and the waves, the last part of that scripture, they said, what kind of a, what kind of a man is this? Who are we hanging out with? There's something that moves us from the, 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 the kind of the dreamy-eyed Jesus on a picture on the wall to this person and wakes us up from our thinking that the world can get at us while God's sleeping somewhere and can't see us. The third scripture he read was about, about something that was going on in Peter. There was a roadblock in Peter. Jesus saw it. He saw it in all the disciples. There was something there. There was something in the soul of Peter that became something that the Word of God couldn't penetrate. That that, whatever it was, would always get in the way. And it comes down to this time where Jesus uh, uh, is telling them about this (laughs) during the first communion service. 
And he's saying to the man, come and eat my, you know, eat and drink. And this is my body. This is my flesh. And then right after that, he says, man, you're going to deny me. What kind of service would, would you like to go to that service? I, we've, all, we've all been to that service, actually. Where he begins to say, Rick, there's something in you, man, that's a roadblock. There's something in that you take that vote first. And you look at that issue first before you even trust me. So faith gets compromised. Teaching gets, gets to the, the place where it's not practical. I miss that moment of reproof. I miss that moment of correction. I miss that moment of being trained for righteousness. The Old talk, Testament talks about the Lord trains my fingers for war. The nuances of walking with God. And so we find ourselves in this 32nd chapter with these things in us. This scripture God breathed. This, who is this man? Who is this king that I serve? That even the winds and the waves obey him. And man, Lord, there's a roadblock in my life. Or there's a roadblock in somebody I love. And man, there is something, God, you're getting at. And we see this in the life of Jacob. How many scriptures are there in the Bible that mention Jacob? Bible trivia, get ready for Jeopardy. How many? About? 50, okay. Anybody else? 200? All right. Do I hear three? <laughs> All right. 312 scriptures about Jacob in the Bible. It says that when we get to heaven, we will sit at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if you, if, man, if you just soak on this, 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 this work of God that's doing, that he's doing in this 32nd chapter. Now, you, it, we, we move from this moment of him being in this, this country, this area of Haran, which would be eastern, I'm sorry, which would be western Turkey to us. And we see this now, this move back toward the promised land. Now Jacob is returning with all these flocks and all these animals and servants of every kind and, and the moms that are with him. He's moving back. So he, he has to take a route where these animals can be watered, where they can be fed, where the, the family can rest. And that route leads him where? To eat them. Well, guess who's the prince of Edom? Esau. See, God will bring us back to what we didn't deal with before. He'll bring us back. We'll return to it. All right? Forty times, for 40 years, they took laps around the wilderness, didn't they? All right? They were supposed to be there for 40 days because there was something that they had to catch that they kept resisting. That Jacob, God is going to checkmate this guy in this chapter. Because Jacob's a cunning dude, isn't he? All right, he's able to see the, the crack in the situation and able to exploit it, manipulate it, turn it for his good. And yet there's coming in Jacob's life the reality of what it says in Malachi. It says it in the New Testament too, but I love this. It says God loved Jacob. He had a heart of love for Jacob. He believed in Jacob. And Jacob's roadblock kept Jacob from enjoying that love. And so God brought him as a man who was going to be a unique part of this Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's playing a unique part as a head back to the promised land. Now, verse 1, as Jacob went on his way, the angels, met, angels of God met him. Jacob said when he saw them, this is God's camp. So he named it Mahanaim. This is God's camp. Isn't it amazing that the first verse is talking about there is God's Angels on the same path with him, intentionally there. That there's something about this all scripture that's being parked in front of him 
and being parked in front of us. Because number one, we have to understand in the revelation of this story today, is heaven is a free gift. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. Ephesians says, in 2, 8 and 9, it says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no man, no one, may boast. See, there's something about the Jacob, this supplanter, this, this cunning uh, person who's able to pick up on situations and turn them for his own good, getting ahead of God. There's something about this, this part of his soul that's entering into this part of his life where he's shifting from this early part, shifting from his being a kid and a, being an adolescent to this being this adult man of God. Shifting from him being by himself and doing things that are easy to turn into twist when it's just you. But when you have all these kids and you have these wives and you have these servants and you have these animals, man, your, your mobility <laughs> has been changed. Your desire for victory is still there, but your ability to pull it off has changed. Verse 3 says, Then Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir. Okay? If, all right, here's the land of Seir. Up here on the end, that's Turkey. That's where Jacob's coming from. And down this way, as he gets to this place uh, between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, as he comes down this eastern way, where did he cross this river, the Jabok River? Right in here is where we find Jacob in this story. We find him at this moment in his life, this, this place where it's one step into the land of Canaan. We see God do this a lot of times. We see that with uh, the people of Israel later down the road, he brings them to this, this precipice of the next piece of their lives. And so Jacob, he's not thinking, man, these angels are with me. Man, this is going to be good. He's thinking what? Esau is not liking me. And he is not forgetting what I did to him. And even though God has blessed me, the situation was done in such a way where I was an inch off on the launch to the moon. And that correction didn't occur. And so now we're way off. Now I want you to catch this story. It says that, uh, go into the country and, and uh, find my brother. He said, he, verse 4, he also commanded them, saying, Thus you shall say to, the, to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now. Kind of stating the obvious a little bit to Esau, like Esau doesn't read the paper, all right? I have oxen and donkeys and flocks and male and female servants. I have sent, uh, I have sent to tell my lord that I may find favor in your sight. He's trying to what? Uh, he has no binoculars. He has no drone out to where he knows what's, what uh, Esau's doing. So he sends out this little feeler, and he's trying to make, make nice with Esau, which makes sense. See, the second part of this revelation that's in this, <laughs> in this account with our friend Jacob is, man, he's portraying that man is a sinner. Man can't save himself. He's going to try, but he can't. Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We see the gospel being portrayed in this revelation to us of what God's breathing. Can you feel his breath on your cheek? He's breathing it on us, the people who are so excellent at practice. But God wants to get us in the game. And so this is what happens. The messengers return to Jacob. Now you're going to see the, the sin part here in a second. <laughs> the messengers returned in verse six, uh, to Jacob in the sixth verse. We came to your brother Esau, and furthermore, he's coming to meet you. Okay. And 400 men with him. Why do you take 400 people with you? Why do you feed them along the way? Man, you have got to have a plan in mind. 
Jacob's plan is weak. He's so good at it, but this one's weak. Jacob is playing for the tie in this game. He is. Can't win it. Don't want to lose it. Let's, let's play for the tie. 400 guys are with him. Then Jacob was greatly what? Afraid and distressed. Nothing kills faith like fear and stress. Nothing kills it. Nothing stops the momentum like being afraid and not getting sleep and being up at night. And instead, we might eat the whole cake or we may eat no cake. We find ourselves constantly distracted by a situation that our mind can't resolve. And we go around and we go around. And he divided the people who were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two companies. For he said, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the other company which is left will escape. Folks, man is a sinner. Man can't save himself. Esau's walking into the jaw, or Esau, Jacob's walking into the jaws of Esau. And to him, he already forecasts the worst. In his mind, he already sees the terrible situation that's going to occur. And so he begins to what? Strategize on how he might lessen the blow. Verse 9 says, Jacob said, <laughs> you're going to love this part. This is Jacob praying. This is Jacob's going to pray. We're going to know his prayer. How would you like to have your prayers in the Bible? <laughs> Jacob said, oh, God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac. Oh, Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your relatives, and I will prosper you. See, Jacob is at a beautiful spot. He's not playing God here, like, oh, God, I'm going to sweet talk you. He's saying, man, the only ammo I've got is what you have told me. That's all I've got. I, I don't have a way of fighting Esau. I don't have a way of fleeing Esau. I don't have a way of going forward. I don't have a way of going back. And I will prosper you. And then he says, verse 10. I love verse 10. I am unworthy of all the loving kindness and of all the faithfulness which you have shown to your servant. Man, I'm unworthy of it. There's something about that statement that says that there's a softening in the heart of this man who's learned how, even in godly situations, how to, how to, how to, how to set God's timing aside, God's way aside, and kind of find this, this other way. He's finding himself saying, I have always been, Lord, in a place where you've sought me, you've loved me, you've, you've had a better plan for me, and my way is not working. That there's something about this statement. He says, for, my, uh, for with my staff only I crossed this Jordan. That's, he's talking about 20 years prior. And now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him. The Bible says what? Confess your sins one to another. That God would heal you. Ah, there's something about this. This, this, this guy... I mean, I'm sure the people that were around him and his servants that knew him best were thinking, man, the wheels are falling off of Jacob. All right? I fear him. That he will come and attack me and the mothers with the children. Listen, we will do a lot of adapting for a lot of things, but we will only change for love. That's the only thing. God gets in our heart. And he begins to tug at it. Not so that we become syrupy, teddy bear people. But he's saying, man, it, once, if you don't have love in you, then you have all kinds of other things that will fail. The Bible in 1 Corinthians 13 says love never fails. And we're saying, no, uh, it fails all the time. Remember Susie Q in seventh grade, walked her to her locker, walked her to class. All right? We were so in love. And then she saw some other guy or... Uh, she lost interest in me, and the heartache, oh, I've been pierced through, and we sat outside, outside the school, licking our wounds, okay? Yeah, love fails all the time. He's not saying that love. That love will fail. He's saying my intention and motive won't fail. If you live in my love and my intention, you won't fail. 
But if you manufacture your own, or if you live in what this world calls love, failure will be that which you put on the front of your t-shirt. I fear him. Man, I'm looking after these kids. Because we start to see this amazing role that Jacob has and his purpose. Abraham was a man of faith promised to be the father of a multitude. Isaac had the blessing of his dad. And he was the father of Jacob and Esau. But Jacob is a progenitor. Jacob has these kids. Living people. Twelve tribes. Now, they, as they are following him, don't look like twelve tribes. All right? They look like twelve kids that you used to see in your house. Little kids. Okay? Some are messing around. All right? Some are pulling the donkey's tail. Some are chasing chickens. Okay? They just look like a bunch of kids. But see, Jacob began to see... That what I have is not just precious to me, <coughs> but it's a gift from God. How do I protect this? How do I even participate with this? How do I move from being cunning to being a dad? For you, said, for you God said, I will surely prosper you and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which is too great to be numbered. At the end of Jacob's life, as he goes on to um, this path that Joseph has, has, has opened up, how many souls moved from Canaan into Egypt? Seventy. This family that was Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and then Jacob and these two boys became 70. I don't know about you, but when you farm, all right, you don't take every seed that you have and sow it in the ground. You take some and you eat. So you take some and feed your cattle. You take some and you sell it to others. And you take that that was the best part of that seed, and then you sow it in the ground. That God is taking this life of Jacob and he's saying, all right, I'm going to give you a foretaste. I'm going to give you the 10%. I'm going to give you the beginning of something in the sense that you have 12 tribes. Because when you and I get to heaven, folks, we're going to have to deal with the issue and the reality of 12 tribes. God had said in Malachi 1, the second chapter, I loved Jacob. But we have to understand something, that God is love, but he's also just. He can't let what sin is go unpaid for, unpunished. He can't do it. He won't do it. Because that training in righteousness, see, righteousness is God's righteousness. And it's perfect love, perfect justice. And he's saying, that can't just be not seen. God is love indeed. That's 1 John 4, 8. And he does not leave the guilty unpunished. I'm giving you the shortest, briefest ones so that you can grab them. Exodus 34, 7. He does not leave the guilty unpunished. So there's this seeming conundrum. We see the wheels falling off Jacob in terms of Jacob's way, and we find him facing this tough situation, and we see him in a midst of this calling upon Lord and saying, Lord, you've done this. I see your love. I see your provision. Man, I'm afraid. Verse 13 says this. We're going to look at the supplanter now having no leverage. He's got, he's got nothing to work against Esau. He's got nothing to work against God but there's still some fight left in this guy. It says, so he spent the night there. After this prayer, spent the night where he was. Then he selected from what he had with him a present for his brother Esau. Now look at the effort he goes through. 
Do you ever get up in the night you can't sleep? Clean the oven? All right. Do taxes, okay. Organize your library, okay. Because you can't sleep. Well, Esau is in a situation at night, man. He starts, he, starts, he starts putting together what he can. He said, man, take 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 milking camels and their colts, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, 10 male donkeys. He delivered them into the hands of his servants. Every drove, every, the, the cows, the rams, all in different droves. That means there are different herds being put together and moving in a way that one after the other, but separated a little bit, unique to each. He says to his servants, pass on before me and put space between the droves. He commanded the one in front saying, when my brother Esau meets you and asks uh, you saying, to whom do you belong? And where are you going? And to whom do these animals in front of you belong? Then you shall say, these belong to your servant Jacob. It is a present sent to my Lord Esau. And behold, he also is behind us. Then he commanded also the second and the third, and all those who followed the drove, saying, After this manner you shall speak to Esau, and when you find him, you will say, Behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me. Then afterward I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. What happens when guilt becomes conviction? What happens when regret is not enough to pay a price for something I should have done better in the past or a situation I should not have been in? What happens when I can't spend those things when they don't work? See, you'll see in the chapters that come all this work that he's done here on donkeys and all, all the donkeys he, he got up in the middle of the night, all right, don't mean nothing to Esau. He's looking at this situation to say, man, maybe I'll just get low. I'll just get low and present myself as the servant of Esau. I'll get low and I'll show him that, man, listen, I, whatever's happened in the past, let this be something that tenderizes the stake of your rage, that makes it a little less edgy. Perhaps he will accept me. You know that Edom... That Esau was the beginning and the leader of Edom, the Edomites, red is what it means, to this day are an enemy of Israel. To this day. Because something is, had to be invented in the world and, and pushed along by the devil to make this rivalry, this hatred, stay alive. Something's had to be contrived to make this Arab world hate Israelites. And yet, if you talk to my a friend Johnny and I know down in uh, Trinidad, man, he spent some time as he, refugees, Iranians, and got people from Iraq, people from the Kurds, people from Turkey, have been pouring into Greece because they see a better life that's worth, worth risking their own. <clears throat> And they begin to minister to these people and they share the gospel that they've only been an enemy of this message, but they haven't really heard it. They haven't really heard that heaven is a free gift. They haven't really heard that all men are sinners. They haven't heard that God loves them. They haven't heard that there is justice in God and that there has to be a punishment for the sin. They haven't heard the rest of the story that brings them into the contact and the contest of angels on our way. Angels, the spiritual world, is around us all the time. And he says, those people that come to ashore are so hungry for the gospel, so starving for there to be forgiveness, so so, so looking for, for their wounds to be bound up, their brokenness to be addressed. The man, they're coming to Jesus like, like, like what you would see children do. He had one tribal chief that was so amazed. He wanted to get baptized so bad. This guy influenced hundreds of people. And he was going to tell them his testimony. You can see that coming before the dawn. 
And yet the guy got so caught up, but he hadn't been taught. He didn't know that, that every breath, that what God brings to us is this, the scripture, that there is this breath of God, and he didn't know all that yet. And so he said uh, to our brother Phil, he said, listen, man, would it be okay if I sacrificed the chicken for Jesus? I mean, he, I, mean I just want to give him something. I just want to do something to honor him, okay? And they said, no, no, man, no. We'll help you on that one, all right? So there's something about that's going on here. Well, we see that, that uh, Jacob is not only dealing with his own, um, um, that thing like in Peter that was a roadblock. He's also dealing with what God is calling to him and has purpose for him in. It's gotten tied up in the roadblock. He's seeing that God not only is blessing him, watching over him, protecting him, but his life is a testimony to God in what he does. Verse 21, so the present passed on before him while he himself spent the night in the camp. Now he arose the same night, so there's not much sleeping going on here, and took his two wives and his two maids and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok, right, right there between those two things we already pointed out. And he took them and sent them across the stream, and he sent across whatever he had. God is not calling Joseph or Joseph, Jacob, to conquer Esau, is he? God is going to conquer Jacob. That's what he's doing. He's not pushing him in a corner and kicking him. He's bringing him to an end of himself. We don't respond to heaven being a free gift like we would find a bargain at Walmart. Because we can't mentally assent to faith. We can't just say, oh, that makes sense. I'll give that a try. I'll give Jesus a try. No. You will offend him. Because if he doesn't get all of you, he didn't want any of you. If he can't have all of you, he doesn't want any of you. Because what his son has done is taking your place for the justice that was due you and I. Man, that's what's happened. Jesus died for Jacob's sin. Abraham's sin. Paul's sin. Your sin and my sin. He paid for it. He became a, a sacrifice in the midst of this that wasn't trying to appease something that was natural, like the anger of Esau. He wasn't trying to just get across to Jacob, the man, I love you, and I, man, you're a cool guy. What God was doing was he saying, I want your life to represent the cost that allows you to be what? My testimony. I want your life to represent the cost. So that your life can be a testimony of the resurrection. So Jacob, in verse 22, sent everything across. How many of you know of the Battle of Waterloo? Okay, not the old tune in the 50s, Waterloo. No, it's not that. Waterloo captivated the world because Napoleon had been uh, lost the battle and he had been exiled. And Napoleon didn't get the money that the allies said that they would send to him. They thought, he's in exile. He can die there. Well, they left a the ship there, didn't they? 
So Napoleon gets on the boat with 40 guys. He goes across back to the mainland, and he comes to where Italy hits France. The garrison of the French come out to destroy him. Napoleon steps out in front and says, listen, why don't you guys join me? And in six, six weeks, raised an army of a half a million men. And they went to where in Belgium, this, this, this little town, and the Prussians were there, the Germans were there, the Russians were there, the English were there. Man, this is going to, man, this is going to go on forever. They spent all these years trying to, try to kill this guy. Couldn't do it. Trying to capture him, couldn't do it. They were under his thumb until that one battle. They sent him into exile. Now he's back. Now we're going to have years and years and years of turmoil again. But back, the Waterloo was the end. It was the end. See, we fight enough fights, people, and we think it's just going to be more fight. We do. We just think it's going to be more fight. This is Jacob's Waterloo. Verse 24, one of my favorite uh, four or five words in a row right here. Then Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. This word wrestle, abak, in the Hebrew, it means get dusty. There's nothing like wrestling as a sport. Man, there's nothing like it. It's not a life and death situation because, man, it takes, it takes all your strength. Because it's an unceasing exertion. All right? I, I did it a couple times just in PE class. And it was like, I never want to do that again. Because you can't stop. But it's also this place that it becomes a win-lose. It becomes this going to battle. There has to be a winner. You can't, can't go for the tie. When he saw that, uh, now he's talking about the man, which is God's representative, God himself. When he saw, when he, the man Jacob was wrestling, saw that he had not prevailed against Jacob, he touched the socket of his thigh, so the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Now, I don't know about you, if you've ever dislocated uh, a joint. Man, it's nothing quite like it. Awful. Then the one he wrestled with told Jacob, verse 26, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Man, I've looked at this and I've put it up over the years and I look at it again and again. And one time I'm saying, Jacob, you're just this arrogant dude. And yet, man, I've looked at it differently. Because this is that point where he's saying, please. If Jacob had won the wrestling match, would he be asking for a blessing? He would not. He would have been giving one because he'd be the victor. See? There's something about this that, man, this is a point at which Jacob is conquered. Will you bless me? I can't bless myself anymore. I can't say I can't be blessed because of circumstances. We've all done that. I can't really have the fullness of what God has because opportunities have been missed. I'm not in the right setting. I don't know the right people. We've all been in that situation. I don't, can't run like I used to. We moved a few bits of furniture yesterday and everybody was saying, oh, Rick, I've got it, I've got it. Like I'm some kind of, like I'm some kind of old guy, all right? <laughs> Man, you know, it took a lot to get an amen this morning. It took a lot. Bless me. It's surprising that Jacob asked for a blessing instead of scheming to take a blessing, folks. If we look in Ephesians 2 and we look at the first few verses, we see this situation where Paul is describing you and I. He's describing Jacob. It says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, 
according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. See, this moment, this situation, this resistance of Jacob, we're no different than him. We are absolutely no different than him. And so this one that Jacob wrestled with asked Jacob a question. He says, man, what's your name? Jacob says, Jacob. There's going to be a name change that's going to happen here. And we see name changes a lot in the Bible. But there's something about that name change that's not only you get a cooler name. It's something that represents this conquering of a human being and then uniting that human being with his purpose that you could even call him that by name. See, Jesus Christ is both God and man. It says that in Isaiah. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He died on the cross and rose from the dead to pay a penalty for sins and to purchase a place for us in heaven. See, this gospel, this breath of God is in this chapter where sometimes we just focus on Jacob and sometimes we, well, was this angel Jesus? There was this man he wrestled with with Jesus, right? Well, I was going to say, Jacob knows him as God. He says, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and prevailed. This name Israel means the prince, a prince, one powerful with God. There's something about this, that he has a place with God. As we are reconciled with Christ, we have a place with God. He will show us his will and his heart, and we will hear and we will then operate in his heart and in his will, and animated by himself through the Holy Spirit. He says, your name will no longer be Jacob. You're going to get a new name. Abraham, Abram, in the beginning, his name means high father. Abraham means the father of a multitude. Sarai was Abraham's wife. That was her name in the beginning, which means princess. What little girl on the planet wasn't princess? Really, all right? And to Sarah, which means the mother of nations. Simon in the New Testament, which means God has heard. I was changed to Peter, meaning a rock. Saul, who was Paul, uh, the Saul means asked for or prayed for, and Paul means little or small. That there's something about these name changes that perhaps mean most to the person who's had their name changed. But it is something, as we look at it, Paul had such great revelation, and yet God asked him to walk a, a road that had suffering in it so that he might see not only what he would suffer, but what had to happen to plow the culture and bring them to Christ. To be that plow that went into the ground and started something, began something. Then Jacob asks the name. He said, please tell me your name. But <laughs> he says, why is it that you ask my name? Uh, Judges 13, where um, Manoah, who was Samson's dad, asked the angel his name. I don't know if you recall that, cert that situation. And the angel says, my name is too wonderful for you. 
Man, I love that answer. That is, a, that is the coolest angel answer. Because it's not about the angel. It's not so that Jacob could bow down and say, okay, I'm going to worship that name or I've found that place. He says, no, I've not met with an angel because God has blessed him in the same place he lamed him. So Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God's, God face to face. I've seen him. Yet my life has been preserved. It shouldn't have been, but it was. Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Penuel, and he was limping on his thigh. Therefore to this day the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip which is in the, on the socket of the thigh because he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh in the sinew of his hip. And there's something that man, resonates in this wrestling match even down to our own times, even down to how cultures we even look at this story. There's something about the conquering of this dude, this conquering of Jacob, that says, you know what? Jacob found himself in the place that he was blessed. God did bless him. It says we receive this free gift that we talked about earlier. Heaven is a free gift. We receive this free gift, folks, by faith. It's not by our head, all right? Jacob's head got him in trouble. It's not head knowledge. He's, James 2.19 says to the people, he says, You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons believe and also shudder. Demons believe God's real. But true saving faith is trusting in Jesus Christ alone for eternal salvation. And they said in Acts 16, 31, he says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. My respect for Jacob has gone up. He was not waiting for me to respect him. But to see that how God breathed this word into this chapter that maybe we, we've seen so many times and maybe bits and pieces, that's the way I experienced it, man. But to see it as this breath of God, if the, if the only thing we had is this one page, this 32nd chapter of Genesis, could we, reach, could we reach the world with that? You could. Would it be sufficient to get somebody from being a sinner to being a saint, it could be. It has that much power. And yet so often we study the scriptures and we study our favorite parts over and over and over and we leave the rest like, like it's this kind of this mystery ground. If you ask him and you'll come to him. But it's more than just encouraging you in the word of God. It's encouraging us all who may be at a point in our own life or somebody that you're praying for that's at this point where it's life and death. But God intends it for life. And God is in the prospect and the purpose of well, that person not going to die, but they're going to be reconciled to him. Can you, can you hang with him there? Can you stay with him there? Can you allow yourself to cross that river, to spend that night alone, to wrestle or do we want to make it so easy that somebody's going to come over to my house and make it all right? Or I'm going to get a check in the mail. I just believe it's time for the body of Christ to learn how to come before him individually so that we might have some, something of substance when we come together corporately and something to go into this world with than more than our best effort. Let's pray together. Father, we bless you. We thank you. Thank you for your word, how great it is. How, how we couldn't understand any of it if it weren't for you. And so, Lord, we just thank you that, Father, it's not studying hard. It's revelation. It's something that God brings that reveals not just the understanding, right? but, Father, it reveals, Lord, the walking it out, the difference that it makes. Hey, you know what I read today? You know what I saw today? And pretty soon we're talking to somebody on the phone and we're telling them that heaven is a free gift and you can receive this gift by faith. We bless you, Lord. We thank you for it in Jesus' name.
Father, we bless you for your testimony when we see you face to face. I thank you, Lord, that your testimony, Father, is so alive, so real, uh, so evident that, Lord, you are face to face with us even now. And we just thank you, Father, that uh, as we receive your presence, as we listen to your voice, as we move our ear more closely to your mouth, and we find that, Lord, you're not speaking just to my ears, but to my heart. We just thank you for that, Lord. And as we in this room look out through these windows that face upon the community that we live in, oh God, give us your heart for this place. Give us your heart for these homes and, Father, for these people in all their many ways. And that, Father, that you would give us uh, not only the view, but, Father, that those steps, those few steps from where I am to where they are. And so, Lord, we just thank you for that and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless me the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred mind is like to that above. Go in grace. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week.